All right, last week on page 24, I started just with sort of an initiation into this topic of dealing with heart issues. So we don't get caught up in just behavior modification. We don't want to just see someone stop doing something wrong. Uh, we'd like to see that their heart has changed, that repentance has taken place both of their heart and their behavior. The occupation we talked about was worship. That is the vocation, occupation of every person's heart. Every person is a worshiper, either of themselves or uh, of God, or something off of themselves in the sense of something they've created, as Romans 1 tells us. And if you remember some of the things about worship, you seek after what you worship, you serve it, you talk about it, you spend time, energy, and money, there's sacrifice involved, and you trust and hope in it, that it will give you what uh, you want. Let me move to number three here, the frustration. And we now move into the whole area of sin. Uh, sin in the heart, I don't think we need to go over uh, that every person is uh, a sinner, born a sinner. Uh, but for those that might be listening in, uh, with Romans chapter 3, it's very clear that we all are born in sin. There is no one good. We are not born morally neutral. We are not a blank tablet. Uh, we are depraved. And that is sin has affected every part of our being. And the more a person lives out that sin, the more utterly depraved they'll become. And we can thank God for his grace, his common grace in the lives of people and unbelievers that they do not, everyone doesn't live out uh, what they could. So we're dealing here with a frustration. And let's think about this for a minute. This area of uh, the Old Testament seems to put it in the category of idolatry and also terms like craving and obviously sin but uh, idolatrous cravings the New Testament talks a lot about the area of lusts and especially in 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 to 17 in three different categories with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And that's just going on. These could be good desires that have turned lustful. Uh, oftentimes, good desires can turn lustful. Like James 4 talks about... Uh, why are there wars and fights uh, among you? Uh, because you lust and you do not have. You, you crave these things and you get into battles. But oftentimes, their good desires turned lustful. And I want us to take a look at a, uh, its narrative. And so we want to be a bit careful here with narrative. But there's a snapshot that God gives us in Ezekiel chapter 14. And it's to the prophet Ezekiel as the leaders of Israel come to him seeking, uh, inquiring from God through the prophet. And God gives us a sort of a snapshot of the heart of these leaders. In chapter 14 of Ezekiel, if you'll follow along with me, let me read this. Then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols. Now, what's the prepositional phrase there? Where are these things? In their hearts. Which is intriguing because we know they continually had problems outside their hearts, with these huge altars, uh, whether they were up on high places, uh, underneath uh, green trees, on the mountaintops, just these altars. Uh, we know they were outside, outside the gates, and reform after reform. 
You know, someone else would come in, a godly king, and he'd take them down, like Josiah and others, and they would bring them down, and then others would erect them. And we said, boy, it's just idolatry. They're struggling so much with idolatry from other uh, nations. Why? Well, <laughs> it was outside because it was inside. What they were doing out there on the hills was because of what was going on in their hearts. And he says here, they've set up their idols in their hearts. They put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? Therefore, speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord, the Lord God. Any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart. Do you see anything interesting there just uh, with singular and plural? It's, it's plural in a singular heart. Which doesn't surprise us with the New Testament with the lusts. In James 1, every man's tempted when he's drawn away by his own lusts. Um, he puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I the Lord will be brought to give him an answer in matter of view of the multitude of his idols. The multitude of his idols. In order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through all their idols. In verse 6, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, join a support group. <laughs> no. No, it says repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. There were th These were outside because there were these little idolatrous lusts within. And I don't want to build a whole theology on a portion of narrative, but when you begin looking at Romans 1, worship that's going on, and you don't want to worship God, you'll worship self and you'll worship something else, you begin to see this pattern of First John the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, uh, these cravings from the heart. And James 1 is very uh, instructive that we give in to temptation because we're tempted after our own lusts from within. And so within you have this, uh, how many are there? I don't know. John Calvin said the heart is a factory of idols. And we just have lust, and they, there are so many of them. But I'd like us to think for a minute what many of them might be. And again, why does someone do what they do? And we're going to look at that in a minute. They're, they're out here because in miniature form, they're within the heart. So let's just think for a minute. What are some of the common idolatrous lusts that people worship? that we are tempted to worship. Now this is getting at heart level. This is not just behavior. This is rooted right in our hearts. What are some of them? Is, the, uh, is self kind of the biggest idol that drives it all? That you're, I mean, you have different outlets for it, but yeah. it's all worshiping yeah. yourself. Yeah, good point. Self is connected to all of them. All right? They're all idolatry is self-serving, self-deceiving, and self-destructive. But it's all geared itself. So that's why the gospel, when it comes in 2 Corinthians 5, what's Paul say? He who died, he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him. Now you have for Christ, who died very rose again on their behalf. Self is indicative of what a person will worship, and all's wrapped around self in some way. It's tied to self worship. I mean, when you think about even when they would sacrifice their children to Moloch, what was that for? It was that they might receive, whether it was fertility, uh, whether it was crops, better crops, but they're willing to sacrifice, but it was for their good not their grandparents or friends down the street. 
what are some of the common idolatrous lusts that we are so tempted uh, to follow after? Chris? I think of plenty that start out okay but turn bad like sports, recreation, entertainment. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, that could be a huge one. Let's just put pleasure and entertainment. I mean, it's a huge issue. Uh, we like to be entertained. We like uh, self-pleasure. And you look at the everything in our advertising caters to this, um, to comfort, pleasure, entertainment, sit back, relax. And, uh, and a, a desire, you have to be really careful here, a desire for rest you just have to watch it's, that it's not an occasion for your flesh, as uh, Paul instructed the Galatians in Galatians 5, or was it 6? Where, uh, 6, where he said, uh, you're in the liberty, stand fast in the liberty, but don't use your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but in love serve one another. It just Our liberty is not for our fleshly indulgence. So you have to be really careful sometimes on this area. What else is it that we tend to worship? Yes. Acceptance from men. All right, here's a man's approval. Probably one of the uh, key idolatrous lusts that we're tempted. This is also called a man-fearer, a man-pleaser, the fear of man rather than a God-fearer. The world calls this codependency. All right. And, uh, but it is, not, it is a temptation that is very common. And uh, you men uh, will be tempted in this particular area, some of you more than others. Getting up in front, teaching a Bible study or a class or in a church and you preach and you'll begin to think, what do they think? What do they think of me? What if I stumble? What if I stutter? What if I say something wrong? And you begin, if you're not careful, to just get, paralyzed with anxiety and fear at man rather than fearing God. All right, what else? Materialism. Yes, materialism. You get into, um, we'll put materialism, possessions. Uh, and everyone has their way of worshiping this. You know, we could even put in here lines of motives, thoughts, beliefs. This is their liturgy. I mean, everyone has a liturgy of how you worship, however you lust after something. Um, it may be more of a normal kind of lusting, or it might be a bit bizarre. And you meet some people, and they're caught up in some sin, and you're going, well, that's not normal. Well, not, it's not normal type of worship. But when you, when you find out what they think and believe and want, it makes perfect sense what they're doing. Someone's cutting themselves. When someone's starving themselves. What do you think someone's after when they're starving themselves to death? And we're not uh, talking like the eating issue of anorexia. What do you think is so important to someone who's starving themselves to death? Man's approval, that's part of it. Attention. Uh, could be, I mean, depending on who it is that they're seeking to please. Control, uh, control is a huge issue. Um, uh, to control. I want to be, let's say it, what it is. I want to be sovereign. All right? I want to be sovereign. I want vacancy in the Trinity. Uh, I'd like to be in control, and I'm going to make things happen. And usually this is, it's usually in the teen years. The median age is somewhere around 15 to 17. And uh, they don't have control over much else. Uh, they're still in their parents' authority. But their body, hmm, that's my body. That's what they begin to think. This is my body. I'm in control of this. And then there's another one that sets in, a big one, appearance what they look like, namely, thin. I mean, you follow this with appearance, 
They may find some pleasure and comfort there. You put control together with certain people's approval and you bring it all together and you wrap it around some food and you've got anorexia. It's not a disease. It's heart worship. It's idolatry. I mean, you, you talk to someone who is caught up in that and they, it's just as if they put appearance on an idol and they begin to worship it. I will do whatever. I will starve myself if I have to. I will be thin. If I even feel fat, I'm going to not eat. And I will take whatever measures to be thin. I will throw up. I will uh, exercise for hours. I will do whatever it takes. That's my liturgy to worship this appearance. And other people will say, this is abnormal. This isn't right. You're looking terrible. I'm worshiping. <laughs> you know, don't you hear what people are saying? Don't you look in a mirror and see like an emaciated body with bones? You can see all their ribs. Don't you see? Nope. And those who make them will become like them. And it is such worship. And that's why the the key is, where are they with Jesus Christ? Are they a believer? And if they are, where is the lordship? Where is the submission to Christ, the Spirit of God, the Father, his holy word? This is what God says. And his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And we're, we're at a, a real crossroads when you face heart worship. What are some others, other issues that come up? Uh, that we tend to worship. Uh, security. We could put in here significance too. <laughs> the world calls those needs. Uh, we would say they're desires that often turn lustful. If you have to have it. Success. I want to be on top, and I will sacrifice to get on top and be a CEO or whatever, successful preacher. Uh, success. Let me, let me list a few more. Yes? I was going to say, wouldn't you say that, that security and significance, that there, there's, we have a natural, almost God-given, I mean... A desire? A, a desire to be significant in the sense of fruitful and useful yeah exactly <laughs> that, that's that's natural that's not necessarily a you know an idol unless it becomes yes know. but I'd be really careful with that an unsafe person isn't going to want to be useful and fruitful for the Lord um, but once a person is a believer God wants them to be a, a well pruned a fruitful individual. But to have a desire to be safe, a desire um, to be used, uh, to be worthwhile while you're here on earth, I don't have a problem with that at all. But it's when it turns lustful. And we're going to talk about how do you know when it turns into a lust? How do you know when a desire, a good desire, has turned lustful? Because that's, we all have these good desires. I mean, some of you are single, you'd like to be married. How do you know if it's turned lustful or whether it's still just a good desire to want to be married? But let me talk about a few more things that we tend to worship. Respect. Uh, nothing wrong with desiring to be respected, but some people will tough love you right out the door uh, if you were married and not giving your wife respect. Uh, and there's a book written like that, that will, tough love, that will, uh, if you're not giving the right respect, they will take your suitcases and pack your clothes and set them outside and, and tough love you until they get the respect they so deserve for their self-esteem. Uh, health. Health is a huge issue today. I mean, we all have a desire to be healthy. Uh, Something's not right if you desire to be sick. But we all desire to be healthy. But how far will you go with that? How much money will you spend on being healthy? 
because you can't shorten your days or lengthen them. And, you know, why we eat well is because we're a good steward of what God has entrusted to us. You can't lengthen your days or shorten them. It's just the quality of your days will be much improved if you eat well. All right, and you can put a whole lot of weight on, and it will put a tremendous strain on your, your body and your organs, and you'll pay for that, the quality of your day. But it's not that you're going to die or if you take all of these uh, pills that you're going to last longer. And some of you are eating food that has so many preservatives in, you're going to balm yourself before you, you die. But just be good stewards. Be good stewards of your body to improve the quality. But health is a, is a huge lust today. Uh, another one is uh, sex sexual pleasure. I mean, we could put it up here in the pleasure, but sensuality, the desire for sex, I believe is there even before the fall with Adam and Eve. I mean, you just have a natural desire. It is to be fulfilled only in marriage in the context of giving. But it's been abused, uh, misused, deviated from God's plan. Another uh, thing that could be worshipped is uh, fairness and justice. Things have to be fair. And I mean, they'll do whatever it takes for things to be fair and just. And they're the ones who decide what's fair and just, not God. You know, you begin to think through this. Ministry can become idolatrous lust. Ministry. People will sacrifice their wife, their kids, for ministry, missions, anything good can become idolatrous. To be married could become idolatrous or unmarried. <laughs> Some who are married like to become unmarried or to have children. Now, Dr. MacArthur in his book uh, on his commentary in 1 Corinthians where it talks about flea idolatry in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 uh, I do think that was image worship, that they actually were worshiping carved images in Corinth, but very indicative of why they were doing that was heart issues. But he adds this in his commentary on 1 Corinthians on page 232. He says, idolatry includes much more than bowing down or burning incense to a physical image. Idolatry is having any false god, any object, idea, philosophy, habit, occupation, sport, or whatever that has one's primary concern and loyalty or that to any degree decreases one's trust in and loyalty to the Lord. Anything can be worshipped. All right, and that's the... The thing to think through, and you can read A.W. Tozer uh, in his uh, book, Knowledge of the Holy. He says, among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at bottom line a slander on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is. It's in itself a monstrous sin and substitutes for the true God, one made after its own likeness. And then he goes on. I mean, we could go back into some Puritan writings with Charnock on uh, the worship of the heart and idolatry. But the heart can just be full of these things. And what's interesting is that a person, it just depends on what time of day and what day of the week gets the main spotlight. Like during the day, they might get up early, go to work, and they'll put in a 16-hour work day because that's what it takes to be successful. But come Friday night, forget success right now, it's pleasure time. You follow that? And they just start rotating around. That's just what lusts do. And when you see children and what they're uh, lusting after, some of those things, they just remain uh, in their heart. They could even become a bit dormant. But all in the categories of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, you could fit them all into one or 
uh, at least one of those three categories, but it's all reflective of self-worship. And that's what you have to be so careful of when you're talking to someone because what will inevitably happen is this. Will man always approve you? Every man? No. And so there comes some anxiety. Will you be successful in everything? Or will some people get uh, placed above you and things won't work out? Yes. And there's anger. And there's fear that things may not work out. You have fear going on, anger, anxiety, because that's the life of someone who's focused on self. At, at heart, it's unbelief. Unbelief in God, and it's going to be believe in myself and something. These things will uh, deliver. And we'll rationalize. There'll be anxiety, anger, fear everywhere uh, in an individual's heart. And they'll tend to look for some little uh, safety valve that can open up and find some sort of a refuge. I mean, this is, people call this stress. Man, my life, it's just, I can't take this anymore. All this pressure, not only inside, but we live with sinners on the outside. Now, that's some pressure. Uh, you deal with sickness in the world. There's pressure. I mean, you just deal with evil, sickness, and then inside you have pressure, and people go, I'm just stressed out. I, 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 need, I need to blow off some steam here. I need some place I can escape to and find some refuge. Where do people go for a refuge? These are false refuges. Where do people go? Yeah, they'll go to drinking, drugs. What else? Chocolate? <laughs> what was that? Okay. Yeah, sensual pleasure. They'll go eating food. They'll go to food, not for energy to get you to your next meal for the work God has you to do, but they'll go to food to just sort of uh, find a refuge there. I feel so comfortable when I'm eating. Uh, some people go to sleep, and they like to sleep a long time. Exercise. Exercise? Yeah, you go to some of the fitness places and ask, why are you there? If you went around to some of these spectrum clubs and athletic places and just interviewed people, why are you here? You know, some you don't even have to ask, man. They're sitting in front of the mirrors and just, you know, they're, they're just, <laughs> you know, appearance is huge. Uh, health is another big issue of why they're there. Another one is just, this is how I get rid of my stress every day. Um, and it could go on. Uh, some people shop. <laughs> I usually say that when women are present. But it's just all kinds of places we'll go. Reading, escape in novels, try to just go live in a fantasy where you're sovereign and everything's perfect. That's what daydreaming is. Um, where you're sovereign and you paint a per perfect picture, a perfect world. But this is false refuge where people will go to to find uh, comfort. But this is the heart. Spiritually speaking, a worship factory. I mean, it is worship going on there. It is holy ground. And you just get to know people, and you'll find out what they worship. Just start asking questions, what's going on in their life. You know they're a worshiper. God created them to do that. But they're worshiping self, but what are they caught up in? I mean, I, I meet neighbors, and you know they're either uh, worshiping uh, things and possessions. Uh, they're worshiping uh, money. Uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. They're worshiping success. Uh, it's just amazing. This is our hearts before we were saved. Uh, this is uh, the heart of an idolater. 
Now let me, uh, let's give some hope here. <laughs> what we don't want to do is present the gospel that fits into this kind of worship. This is the easy believism. Watch this. Okay, I'm going to back up in here. This is my heart. <laughs> and you come up and say, you know, how's it going? Not too well. <laughs> Lots of stress. Things not working out right. Okay, uh, would you like things to go better? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, you need Jesus. What will he do? Well, he can help you. Okay. He can help me? Uh, help me, you know, maybe get my job back, maybe get my wife back, maybe get uh, my health back and struggling with different things. I mean, he'll help me? Sure. Yeah, Jesus is here. He'll, he'll heal your woundedness and your deep pain. And how can I like that? What do I have to do? Raise your hand. You know, just uh, ask him in your heart. Come on in. You know, come on in. Uh, this is, goes on by the hundreds. You know, raise your hand, come down front, um, ask him in your heart. Uh, okay, come on in and uh, take the tension away. You know, fix me up a little bit here. This is, my life isn't going so well. Help me out here. That's rehabilitated idol worship. And then what they're doing is they're, th they're doing this. Okay, uh, all right, I asked Jesus in my heart. I guess I'm a Christian. Why isn't things going a little better here? You know, you promised that he would help me. Uh, this isn't, I'm not seeing it. You know, I, I'm still trying to make this thing happen here. And it, this isn't working. And then you're saying, well, you need to get in the word of God. You need to fellowship with God's people. I don't know if I can fit that in. I mean, I've got, I've got a job. I've got these things, you know. And No, we need to get a Bible study. I, want, I need to disciple you. You're a new believer. Oh, man, I, you, you expect me to read the Bible and pray? And what, what is all this? Be at church a lot? I mean, I, I can't fit that in. I want this fixed. That is so common that people bail out and a lot of well-meaning Christians are perplexed. What happened? Did they lose their salvation? Are they a carnal Christian? <laughs> no, they're still an unbeliever. And that's what you don't want to do, is present the gospel in such a way that in the ears of an idolater, is this going to help my life get fixed? Or is this the end of my life and it is the whole beginning of living for Christ? A total heart change. So, person hears the true gospel that Christ came to deliver us uh, from self, that we would no longer live for self, but for him and live for Christ who gave his life as a substitute for our sin and took the wrath of, the, of God on our behalf and accounted his righteousness on our account what, what a blessed gospel. Now a person, let's say, God saves them. Okay, God draws them to uh, himself. He saves him. The Holy Spirit is resident now, sort of as the primary one, although it says Christ in your hearts in Colossians. In some way, God, all Trinity, uh, is there. But the Holy Spirit, the main a uh, person of the Trinity who's in work applying re, uh, redemption to us and helping us with sanctification, Christ praying on our behalf. So you have the Holy Spirit there, and now you're thinking, all right, this person is born again. They are a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away, right? Oh, new thing, all's become new. Why am I still tempted, and why am I still lusting, and why am I still have these habits why I still get angry and anxious and fearful? Now we have a war going on. Now the flesh 
Paul calls this, as Dr. MacArthur calls it, the unredeemed humanness of self. But that sinful principle within, I think Dr. Zemek uses the two terms, anything that has self with it or independence, I think that's right. Define the flesh. Self-serving, self-pleasing, self, you fill in the blank, that's our flesh. And uh, independence, which we were never created for. So I don't want to submit, I want independence and self, that's flesh. Uh, the marks of the flesh. You have this war going on that Paul gives us uh, there in Romans 7 as well as in Galatians 5. Now, about all this worship that went on. Well, there are things that the Lord wants to do immediately. He wants this thing to shut. You don't go down here to false refuges. You find God as a refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. He becomes our refuge. Things getting tough, pressure's on. Now we have a whole other enemy out here called Satan coming in. You have the world pressing in with its philosophies and ideologies. You got a lot of pressure coming in from the out, outside. You have the flesh within, the enemy within. But God wants to be our refuge. And so when things are tough, you don't flip the TV on and say, I need to escape through that. I don't want to go to food. I don't want to go to another person, human being. I need to go to God. Not that other Believers, you can't pray with them and, and talk with them, but he wants to be our refuge. I believe that's 46.1, isn't it? Uh, God is our refuge, uh, a very present help in time of trouble. Now what God is after is because he's a jealous God for our good, is he wants to see all of this worship decrease. And worship of him to increase. So if I could draw it over here, with God, he wants worship to increase. Anything fleshly, the worship there, to decrease. Commonly called sanctification. Putting off putting on. Colossians 3, Ephesians 4, uh, Romans 13, 14, put off the deeds of the flesh, make no provision for the flesh, put on, now watch this, you don't put on just a new habit. What's Paul saying in Romans 13, 14? Put on what? The Lord Jesus Christ. You are putting on Christ-likeness. Be careful here with this. You'll get, you'll find Christians who are on some uh, bent towards some righteous activity in their life. Maybe they are uh, seeking to put on um, church fellowship. You know, whenever the let's get together. Uh, maybe they're putting on. Uh, and it's their main quest to study God's word aright as if that's the end. The church at Ephesus was much like that in Revelation 2. Very orthodox. They, they'd sniff out a, a false teacher from a mile away. And they'd test them, anyone who said they were apostle, and they were out of there. Well, they, they, they were, discernment was right up here and spotting error sort of maybe going back to when Paul warned them, you know, people are going to rise up from within and without in Acts 20 to the Ephesian elders. Um, nothing wrong with Bible study. Nothing wrong with fellowship. Maybe they get on a bent, it's all about prayer. <laughs> the one thing with the church at Ephesus, sandwiched in between orthodoxy and purity, was you've left your first love. It's not if that will ever happen to us, it's just when. 
we can get on some zealous quest on some aspect of, the, of Christianity. Maybe it's all about um, Bible study. Maybe it's all about the languages. Maybe it's all about you name it. Nothing wrong with those in and of themselves. <laughs> Don't leave your first love. It's putting on Jesus. It's knowing Jesus. If you're studying languages just to study languages, you've lost it. If you're studying anything here in seminary and Christ isn't the end, you're off kilter. And you can't be zealous in one area of the Christian faith and unfaithful in other areas. But it's all about knowing Christ and being like him. Ephesus had lost that. They had some of the best pastors you can imagine. Apostle Paul, three years. Timothy, probably a year and a half, two years. Then John. You're not going to get much better than those three. (laughs) I don't think you're going to improve on those. But here they had lost their first love. They left him. In quests for some good things. And I just say, beware. Uh, I say that to myself too. It's not if it will ever happen. It's just when. And you know, you'll be after something and you're thinking, it's not really about this. This is a means to knowing Christ and loving Christ. Purity is about being like Jesus. Being orthodox was made for life and walking with Christ. So they had become theologically sterile. So here you have this whole area here where the Lord wants us, if I can uh, find a thing here. He wants us to, you can't remove these things from your heart. You can't remove the lusts from your heart. These temptations will always be there, all of these different things. He just wants worship to increase towards himself. Remember, if we walk in the Spirit, using the disciplines of grace, what happens? You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They're there. The lust of the flesh are in your heart. They will always be in your heart. They may not have as strong of a pull as they once did, but these things that uh, are there, as James says, you know, we're tempted, be drawn away by these things. It's just the ground needs to get really cold and overgrown around these altars and these lusts and really put exercise yourself unto godliness to practice the first works of the disciplines of grace, Bible study, prayer, fellowship, evangelism, all about Christ. And just pursue with your whole heart And then make no provision to go in these directions. You don't put some provision around to go to sensuality. You take whatever measures measures are necessary, Jesus said in Matthew 5. Radical amputation if needed. You, You need to say, well, others might be able to handle the internet. I can't. Maybe others can live in this particular area of L.A., but I can't. I will take whatever measures needed to pursue Christ's likeness in my life. And um, some people can shop at Costco and stock up on Twinkies for their kids' lunches all week. There are others who say, I can't do that. I can't have that much junk food in my pantry. It's just a temptation. Don't do it then. Don't make provision uh, for your flesh to fulfill it in its lust thereof. This is the heart worship uh, that we talked about um, earlier. You've heard uh, Brian and Justin also allude to it. This is the, the pulsating heart that God sees when he looks at our heart. And it's out of this flows all the issues of life. And people do what they do because of their worship and what they're worshiping, or the combination of things they're giving into with their lusts. But a believer, a Christian, who's walking in the Spirit, the disciplines of grace, and finding a refuge in Christ, will not find themselves down here, 
and false refuges, they will not find themselves walking after or fulfilling these lusts. They'll actually be going to the Lord for strength uh, to live in a manner pleasing to him. This is, uh, in your notes there, that frustration of the idolatrous cravings of the heart. Now, here's a question, and we'll handle this right before the break. Let me come over here. How do you know when a good desire has turned lustful? The idolatrous lusts. How do you know when a good desire has turned lustful? For some, uh, some of you who are single and say, man, I would really, I would like to be married. I want to be a godly man and I would love to be married to a godly woman and serve the Lord together. That's a great desire. Uh, good desire is there before the fall. But there are some that say, I've got to get married. You don't understand. I need to get married. I must get married. I'm desperate. That, that kind of terminology. Here's a way of knowing when something has turned lustful, and we'll call them bookends. It's not a biblical term, but there are things that from the beginning and at the end kind of help us. I'm willing to sin to get this. That's the first bookend. I'm willing to sin to get this. Uh, it's not just I want it anymore. I have to have it. I need it. I must have it. And I will sin to get it. And you'll find people who will steal. They'll marry someone that uh, is an unbeliever and they, they suspect they're an unbeliever, but it doesn't matter. They're a willing person. I mean, they'll sin to get it. The other bookend, and you can almost guess this one, I'll sin if I don't get it. And people will get involved in all kinds of sin if they don't get what they are craving for. It might be in self-satisfaction. Sexually, I'm using that as an example here. It might be uh, anger. Uh, And it shows up being moody, grumbling, complaining. I didn't get what I wanted. And they're now sinning because they didn't get it. And those are just two helpful kind of questions to ask yourself. You know, there's some good desires. Some of you are married and would like to have children. Great desire. As long as you don't get to a place where we're willing to sin to get children or we're going to sin if we don't. Um, A lot of you would say, I'd like to do well in seminary. I'd like to, you know, have honors or I'd like to really do my best and have a certain grade point average. Not necessarily is that a wrong desire to do your best for the Lord, but are you willing to sin to get it? I mean, give up other God-given responsibilities to get this thing. Or sin if you don't. Grumble, complain, and people don't want to be around you because you didn't get that specific grade. Those are things that are, that's real stuff with us, isn't it? I mean, that is heart issues. Uh, Desires that have turned lustful. And you can see different things listed there that can help But every one of these idolatrous lusts, there are lies as well as the lust. There are lies as well as the lust in the sense that there are things you want and there are things you think. And until you can talk to people and say, I want this, I mean, I've got to have it. Okay, why? What are you thinking? Just listen to those. They're lies. God's not good. He's not going to give it to me. Um, he's not out look, looking out for my best, so I've got to. He's not all wise, 
So I have to enter in and give them my, some of my wisdom. You understand that? I mean, there are lies in there, not just the lust and motive for something. Lies and lusts. Um, and you begin to see how they're all uh, an attack on the character of God and who he is, his goodness, his mercy, his sovereignty. Why would I even think I could have control when God's sovereign? I talked with a guy who was struggling in the area of sexual immorality uh, with pornography on the internet. And he goes, well, you know, I, I struggle uh, when my wife leaves and I'm home all alone. Okay, run that by, by me again. You're tempted to uh, pursue sensual pleasure on the internet when your wife leaves. And what was that next phrase? When I'm all alone. Hmm. I thought God was omnipresent. Now, if I'd asked him, is God omnipresent? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll quote Burkhoff for you. You know, yeah, he's omnipresent, you know, omnipotent, and all the omnis. You obviously don't believe that and are dwelling on that. You're telling yourself a lie that you're all alone. You're never all alone as a Christian. Never. The Lord's eyes in Proverbs 15 are in every place looking over the evil as well as the good. I think that's verse 3. You're not alone. Do you understand the lies that come with this? Not just what I want, but the lies I have to believe. You know, why did you take that, that job that now you're compromising uh, some of your beliefs, your morals. Why did you do that? Well, you know, I had to. Because, I mean, things weren't working out. You mean the trust in God and what he was going to provide? Well, you, don't, you just don't understand. No, I mean, is God God? And let's study God and his character. But there are lies continually that we will fabricate ourselves and our own thinking as well as the lies we believe and so this is definitely things to process yourself or your own heart before you're ministering to other people and their hearts. But when they sit in front of you and they're a worshiper and they're struggling with an issue, what you're asking questions about is what's going on in, in the heart. Now, only God can see the heart perfectly, but asking questions what is it that you want so much you're willing to sin to get it? Or sin if you don't? Well, I've got to have this. There's one. You know, what, whatever category goes in, pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the lies that go with that. What else? And sometimes I'm talking to people, and for me to live is, and they fill in the blank, and uh, it's not Christ. They fill in the blank with something else. There's an issue. And you're looking for words like this. I need, I expect, my rights, I have to have. These are the kind of things you're looking for. The words that are real key when you're sitting there as a pastor and you're helping people and you're hearing that, I have to have, I must have, I need, I expect, my rights. Those are tip-offs that whatever that is, that they say is a need or right or expectation, typically is a lust. It's become a lust. Maybe it was good to start out with, but now it's become a lust. And uh, you just listen for those kind of things. It's sort of like a... Rachel, who said, give me children or I die. Hmm. <laughs> give me children or I die. Life isn't worth living if you don't give me children. The second one did cost her life, didn't it? Benjamin. And uh, it should be, give me Christ or I die. It's all about him. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Uh, Maybe a 10-minute break, 
and come back and we're going to pick up now in, in helping a person through this. Let me read uh, two verses for you. That It's interesting here about the showing about God, looking at the heart. Psalm 44, verse 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21. Psalm 44. This is what it says. If we had forgotten the name of our God or worshipped a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Hey, it's just the whole, he looks at the heart, the worshiping heart. We're not going to fool him. Uh, if we start looking after something or someone else to worship, uh, even a foreign god, the Lord would search it out. He knows the secrets of the heart because that's where it's going to come out from. And uh, what is needed on page 24? Regeneration. Not rehabilitation. All right? Regeneration. Uh, uh, as far as, I'm not talking about a Christian here. Uh, take, if you take Christ out of this, when you have a self worshiper totally, purely, what is needed is regeneration, the gospel. Then for a believer, you put Christ in here and the Spirit of God and this war going on with the, the world flesh and uh, Satan. Now is the whole area of sanctification, and primarily you see a premium in the New Testament on renewing your mind. Renewing the mind, number five there. And this is a battle. You'll see it come up continually. Romans 12, 2. Now be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4, 23. Be renewed. And the spirit of your mind. In 1 Peter 1, 13, uh, gird up the loins of your mind. You're going to see this continually of working out our thinking and, and what we want, what we think, which is all part of this. That our mind is stayed on the Lord. We're thinking his thoughts, the mind of Christ. It's revealed in scripture. And that takes work. Uh, this isn't just let go and let God. This is not uh, kick back and let God just change you and be passive. This is active work. This is exercising yourself unto godliness that Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 9. It takes active work. Holy sweat is what the Puritans called it. Uh, dependent work on the Spirit of God and cooperating with him. This is a transformation of the mind and heart. It's dealing not just with the lust and repenting of those, but the lies as well. So that you're saying, what is it I'm believing? Uh, for that one guy, I, I thought I was alone. I mean, I know better than that. I know God is omnipresent. All right, I'm going to do a major search in God's word. I want to renew my thinking. I am never alone. God is here with me. He is in me. And so memorizing and meditating on verses that talk about being in the presence of God, walking with him, honoring him, pleasing him, and when no one's around, at least human being, God is always there. Some things like that in the area of transformation. Then it moves on to number six on page 25 which is the subject of glorification. And that whole process, it's not an event of sanctification. Not, I'm not talking about the initial setting apart uh, in the body of Christ or being put in Christ uh, or the baptism of the Spirit, being baptized into the, the church. I'm not talking about that as sanctification, although that's an aspect of it. We are set apart as an act talking about the progressive, ongoing process of becoming like Jesus until glorification. And that was one of the uh, primary desires of Paul's life that he reflects in Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, you go Philippians 1. Uh, he longed to die and be with the Lord. We long to live here on this earth. 
And the more we think about worshiping God here and saying, I am, I am so tired of the flesh, the world, and the devil, today would be a good day to die. You know, I, I want to be with the Lord. I want to worship him in, in total spirit and in truth. No, when you think about glorification, look at this. This is all gone. I mean, just erase all this stuff. New body. I mean, just total worship of God. He gives you a new glorified body. No enemies, no flesh. Just perfect 100% worship of our God. And Paul longed for that, and so should we. And we don't talk enough about the Lord's return. We really don't. I rarely hear that, and I'm ashamed to say I, I don't speak about it as much as I should. Um, that was their hope in the New Testament church. They talked about it. They sang about it. Um, they were encouraging each other, and they were saying, Lord, come quickly. Come today. Um, and regardless, I don't know, you know, various reasons why people uh, don't talk about it. It might be in some circles, there all the different views on eschatology. But Christ is returning uh, and on to glorification. The summary and conclusion. Let me just... Uh, Close this one section here. You're sitting here. You're a worshiper. I am too. And I think our hearts reflect more of God is there, this battle that's going on, uh, sometimes during the day better than others. We'd like to see more increase and more decrease of anything but the Lord, but more increase of worship of God. How do you know what you're worshiping and I would say start with letter A there. Pray daily, uh, as David did after he looked at God's omnipresence and omnipotence. Uh, I mean, there's nothing I can hide from God, Psalm 139. And then he concludes with, search me, O God, and know my heart. You know, try me, test my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me. Let God do his searching through the mirror of his word using the spirit of God. Ask yourself, what are my goals, expectations, and intentions? What is it I'm after? What's my chief ambition? Paul said what his was in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, to be well-pleasing to Christ. What's mine? What's mine most of the day? My chief ambition. What do I become anxious over, fearful over, or angry over? Now, if whatever you get angry over, that's a really good uh, sign. And, and don't think that it's all righteous anger. Uh, I think that might be very a, a rare occasion. But when you're angry, whether you explode or whether you implode and clam up, what are you angry about? And that might help you know what is so important to you, you're willing to sin if you don't get it. Um, anger, anxiety. What are you so fearful about and anxious over? I mean, the birds don't worry. Why should you? What is so important to you that uh, you're willing to sin in anxiety over this? It, those are just they're, they're questions that really go right at the heart of what we tend to worship. What motivates you? You say, uh, it's been a good day. How'd your day go? It went well. Define a, a good day for me. What, what makes it a good day versus not so good day? Well, I got my to-do list done. That's what a, a real good day is? Yeah, it has to be profitable. Hmm. And if God redirects your steps where you can't get done what your list is, then I'm angry. You don't want to be around me. Yeah. So you're asking questions that, um, what is it that I want so much that I don't want to be like Christ for this? I, I wanna, I'm going to sin to get it, sin if I don't. 
what perceived rights have been denied, what biblical standard or principle permits that thought, word, or action. These are just questions that probe uh, what I tend to worship instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for a believer, it's going to be broken type worship. I mean, if it was just full-blown worship of everything but the Lord, that's an unbeliever. For believers, it's just this battle going on. Uh, the flesh, war against the spirit, I want to worship Christ. And the next minute, you know, I'm in my, my time, my Bible study and prayer, and Lord, you know, you're wonderful, this, that, and the other. And then you go to your prayer life now, Lord, I've got some things I need you to do today. What just happened there? You know, you're worshiping God, and then you snap your fingers, and I got these things you gotta, you got to make happen today. Uh, uh, and I, I, I sin in this area. I respond sinfully. What is it I want so much that I'm responding like this? Acknowledge what it is. It's a, an idolatrous lust, sin of idolatry, worshiping not Christ but something else, namely it's all related to yourself. I want, take full responsibility, ask forgiveness from God, and whoever else is part of that worship process you've been possibly using. And repent. Letter F there, study God's character. The more you study God, the more you'll worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, he wants us to know him and usually when we're worshiping something other than God, our view of God is skewed. Be ready to learn how to replace an idolatrous lust with the worship of God in spirit and in truth. And just be ready for it. Unbelief, uh, temptation is going to put cast doubt on God, just like Satan did with Eve. Has God really said? Is he really after your good? You know, does he really know what's best for you? And we have to say, yes, he does. And I will wait. I will wait on him in this. I will not sin to get what he has not provided. I will not sin. If he hasn't provided, I will learn contentment in whatever state I am with thanksgiving and please him. But that is a process. And if you're working on the self-improvement projects, the, the, here's areas you can go off in and say, what is something that is so important to me that I tend to sin in? You know, if you just think, I'm sinning, I, I don't want to sin in this particular area, trace it back, you'll find some idolatrous craving and lust. What are the lies associated with it? And repentance would be putting on truth and worshiping God and correcting usually some view of God that's been skewed for you to continue sinning in a particular area. That's heart, uh, dealing with the hearts of people. Now let her see, and we're going to move into the models of sanctification as you have them. We're only going to deal with three. Are you familiar with the book on five views of sanctification? The critical... Uh, book. Let's see if I can move this up a little. Okay, let's start with this Wesleyan view uh, of Christian perfectionism. The Wesleyan view, as it states even in your notes there, a second work of grace catapults the believer. Now that's what they would call a believer. All right. Oftentimes the person may have just gotten saved. You see this right here? They're saying a person gets saved here in their Christian life. Their life is a struggle all along here. And right here is a crisis. And this catapults them up, this believer, into the state of sinlessness. Now the Bible calls that death. <laughs> It's the doctrine of glorification. Uh, but what may have happened here when a person says, I'm just not like the person I used to be at all. They may have gotten saved. Genuinely, God may have saved them. But to say this person is sinless now, 
which is often called entire sanctification. And what happens with the word sin, sin is defined as only that which is a willful transgression of the known law of God. Anything we do not clearly intend to do or are ignorant about is merely a mistake. Lots of mistakes. And so spiritual growth takes place after the second work of grace by increasing in good works. You can even read more on this if you'd like. I mean, you can read it in, in books on it, like the five views of sanctification. Uh, you can uh, check out nazarenechurch.org, and they'll have it right on their website, uh, the Christian perfectionism. A state of sinlessness. I wish that were true. You know, I wish you, you could get to a state where you just make mistakes. <laughs> All right, the Keswick view, probably the most common view that we're going to end up dealing with is this one, the Keswick view. Whether a person has ever studied it or been taught formally in it, they hold to it. And the majority of churches that, that I hear about, this is the common uh, view on how to change as a Christian, you know, often called the higher life or deeper life, and some have roots back into... Uh, those who study it in the churches today in the watchman knee. But what they believe is this. It's a unique post-salvation commitment or enlightenment, and it allows the believer to enter into a victorious and consistent life of obedience. So, uh, and a lot of emphasis on the victorious Christian life. The struggle with sin continues, but it is lessened significantly by the new truth that has been understood and accepted. Spiritual growth takes place after that primarily by a passive trust in the work of God, appropriately represented by the slogan, let go and let God. Now I know this um, view quite well. I was saved at age 18, went to a Bible college, um, who the president of the time was Robertson McQuilkin, who wrote the view, Keswick, the Keswick View in the Five Views of Sanctification book. And so he was the one teaching the Christian life growth class my freshman year in college. And so I was sitting in there when he was going over all of this Keswick theology. And by the way, for those who uh, know of him, uh, his wife, Muriel, just died last week. Um, she had had Alzheimer's for, oh, I want to say, uh, uh, goes back to around 1990 almost, uh, but she died last week. You familiar with Robertson McQuilkin and his Christian ethics book and hermeneutics and various books? Name doesn't ring a bell at all. Do you know how old he is now? Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how old he is. But he was the president. His father was the president previously at Columbia Bible College, or now CIU. So here's this unique, uh, the teaching here is that you were a believer struggling with sin, and you understood some truth here, and you totally surrendered your life. And in the chapels and conferences, are you familiar with the Keswick conferences over in England and uh, usually New Jersey and uh, some of the major speakers for like Cape and Ray, uh, Jalen Redpath, some of these major Ian Thomas, a lot of these were like these speakers in our chapels for uh, the Keswick view of let go, let God. Totally surrender yourself. Uh, realize some truth that maybe you didn't know before totally surrender, uh, be that living sacrifice. Romans 12.1 was a key verse. You know, lay on the altar, be the, don't crawl off the altar. You know, lay on there, be passive, be totally surrendered, and let go and let God, and now you live life, a victorious Christian life, by just a passive let go and let God. Now let me, let me go through some more here. I may be able to answer some of your questions. 
Well, let me uh, tell you the illustration that was told me in that cafeteria my freshman year. Uh, I mean, when God saved me, uh, this was very, a very real battle going on here. Uh, various lusts all around self and habits, uh, desires and habits, but also God's there. I want to grow in God, but struggling. Uh, I would surrender one day, and I was back, you know, sinning the next, you know, or the same day. And this tension, this, this difficulty, well, in the cafeteria in the Christian life class, the illustration was used like this. Uh, we're in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, at wintertime, most would go up a couple hours up to the Asheville, up above that, up into the... Uh, up to Boone, and go skiing, snow skiing. He says, let's say a lot of you want to go up skiing uh, this winter. He says, you're going to go up uh, to the slopes, and you're going to see uh, on these slopes, you're going to see some people on their skis trying to go up a hill uh, one ski at a time. They're just trying to work their way up the hill, whether it's the bunny hill or whatever hill it is. And then if you say, he says, if you look over here, you're going to see some other people. They're going to, they're going to stand here with their skis, and this chair's going to come around. And you're going to watch something. They're just going to let go. And they're going to let the chair just take them up. He said, there's some people who work at their sanctification. And he says, but God teaches us to just let go and let God. And here I am, I'm a freshman, um, a new believer, and I'm thinking, let go, let God work. Let go, let God work. <laughs> I think I'll let go, let God. And so I would surrender um, every chapel, you know, every conference. I'm letting go more and more. I was reading Robert uh, Boyd Munger's book, is that his name? My Heart Christ Home, checking out every, any stash in my spiritual life that I was hanging on to. I mean, let go, let go, and it just wasn't happening. Um, I guess I was too real saying, yes, my head might be up here, but my feet are still down here. Did you catch that? Your head might be up here, but your feet are still down here. Then you begin to question what? If this isn't happening, my salvation. You begin to question whether you're saved. And then you say, no, I know I am. I know I love Christ, and I, the Spirit of God is in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. But this just isn't happening. Then you're open for new teachings. And the charismatic emphasis was infiltrating at that time. Maybe there's another key. Maybe I need to be slain in the spirit. You know, maybe I need some other second work of grace or third or fourth one. I, I need something else. And that's where a lot of believers are. They're disillusioned with it. They're praying deliverance prayers. They're open for Neil Anderson stuff. Maybe it's demons. Maybe I need exorcisms and and it's just anything and everything that you're open to you know maybe i need to pray the prayer of jabez maybe that would help yeah you know, i mean whatever's coming down the pike i'll grab at maybe that will help me to grow well that there's a lot more i could say about the keswick view the higher life deeper life the let go let god but i want to come back to that and how it applies to us the biblical view, probably best uh, summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith. <clears throat> and you have that listed there, but it's a lifelong cycle of sin, repentance, renewal, growth toward Christ's likeness. And that's a key word. It's a process. It's a lifelong cycle that will only be complete when we meet our Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is accomplished through the active discipline of the believer himself who trusts that the Holy Spirit is energizing his efforts. That's what you call dependent work. Or, as I mentioned, the Puritans called it holy sweat. You cooperate with the Spirit of God within you. And you have to be, kind of be careful. There's a, there's a heresy um, that you do your part, God does his part. You know, this 50-50, um, I forget what it's called now. Maybe some of you know that. But it, it's a, that's not it. It's all of God, and it requires all of me, dependent on all of God. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. It's Colossians 1, 28 and 29. But it's this, this process, and you see it here, going up and up, and there's a gradual growth, ups and downs. And you can see, when we die, we're not like Jesus. I mean, it's not, it's not like, I think I'm almost like him, and then you die. When you die, there's going to be a big change. <laughs> to be like our Lord. And you can read there the confession of faith that talks about this lifelong cycle. We sin, we repent, we want to be more like our Lord and, and decrease in worship of anything but him and increase in our worship of him. And we just continue to do this, just every day, seeking to love Christ more, to worship him more in spirit and in truth. And thank God that we are in him. We don't have to go back and get saved. We thank him for forgiveness through, uh, of our sins at the cross. But point number two, point number two on page 26. I want us to think about this and sort of linger on it, meditate on it. Many people who claim to believe the biblical view, this lifelong cycle, nevertheless fall practically into the errors of other approaches. Now see if this might be true in your life. We might echo both the Wesleyan and Keswick views, when we seem to be waiting for some divine event that will take away the strongest pools of sin and eliminate the need for concentrated self-discipline. You listen to a lot of Christians who are struggling in their Christian life, and what do you hear? I'm praying about it. Well, what are you praying? That the Lord will take it away. What is that? That's let go, let God. He'll just take away my lust. He'll take away the, the pride. He'll just take it every, all my struggle away. Sort of a deliverance mentality. And doesn't require anything of me. I'm just praying about it. Or I'm going, and we're going to look at that in a minute, but this um, waiting for some crisis event that's going to take everything away and I'll be like Jesus. Let her be. We may even echo the Wesleyan view specifically when we admit that we sin often or all the time, when you think about it on a daily basis, omission and commission, we sin all the time, but very seldom confess it or acknowledge it. What is that? How do we make it through a day and hardly ever confess sin? What happened through that day? Did we sin? Yes. But what did we think it was? Mistakes? Practically, we're not much different. And we need to be confessors of sin. Confessors of our sin, of omission and commission. Um, and just being, the more we're in the word, the more we'll know uh, God's standard. And just confess sin. It shouldn't be a, a rare thing with us. Confessing sin and repenting of it. Letter C is one that, as I thought through carefully, I think is very popular in our circles. We may echo the Keswick view specifically when we, quote, let go and let God's word by thinking that the absorption alone of scriptural teaching 
without its practice will change us. In other words, I'll just sit under the faucet of Bible teaching, preaching. I'll go everywhere I can go to just sit and hear it as if let go, let God's word, if that alone is just going to change me. That's all I have to do. I just have to get myself there and let go and let God's word. Go there, let go, let God's word. And think that I'm growing spiritually. And I think that's, a not, that's just a variation of Keswick theology. All of the imperatives are not passive. You do this. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You exercise yourself unto godliness. You encourage one another. You do this. You do that with the Spirit's enablement. It's not hearing the word alone that's going to change you. That will deceive you. That's what James says. Hearing the word alone, you will be deceived. You will think you're spiritually mature, but you're not. And isn't this the case? I think if we're all honest, which I want to think, this is like epidemic. I'm all for getting Bible teaching and Bible preaching, and, but do something with it. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, who will actually self-deceive yourself. If we just hear, we'll become arrogant people. Just arrogant. Knowledge alone just does one thing. It puffs up. But hearing the word and saying, okay, Lord, I hear, I mean, it was exposited so well. I know what it says. I know what it means. Now, how's it need to be applied in my life? And here are the steps to take. And I need to be very active here by the Spirit of God's enablement and through prayer. I need to start sweating spiritually. I need to start putting off anything that's going to uh, pull me towards the flesh. I need to start putting on what's going to help me in my worship of Christ and start doing what I've heard. That alone will help us to change and be more like Christ. Those are some dangers to just avoid. Be very, very careful. And I would say as you're studying and you're, you're preaching, uh, you're teaching Bible studies, don't say here's what it says and means and now let's just close in prayer. Don't do that. You need to encourage your people to change. To change from sin to be more like Jesus. Take the truth, what it was intended, truth was intended to be applied, to change people, and just encourage them to, to think through application, practice meditation. Tom Pennington did a wonderful job in the message, uh, I guess it was during the, he did it a Sunday evening at Grace Church and in the bridge on a Wednesday night on meditation, the bridge between knowing and doing. And help your people to meditate into application into their lives. And then they'll be more like Christ. So I just want to encourage you, um, not next week, in two weeks, we'll pick up on some specific concepts and get into uh, proper God-honoring uh, attitudes. Well, let me uh, close in prayer, and then you can be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one of uh, the men who are here. Lord, what a, what a privilege to be here and to learn your word and to cut it straight, study it aright. Your word's profitable for instruction and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. And Lord, forgive us for uh, taking your word lightly or misusing it thinking that just knowledge alone is all we need. Lord, help us to know that it's knowledge applied that turns us into wise Christians 
who are enabled by the Spirit of God to be doers of your word. So like Paul, we could say the things that you've learned and heard and received and seen in me, these things practice. Lord, help each one of the men who probably are very pressured with so many responsibilities and school uh, studies and work, possibly married and maybe even children and ministries in the church. Lord, help them, help me to apply what we're learning. May we not become enamored with just Bible study or the languages or uh, theology proper or just be enamored with these things, but that we would grow in our worship and become enamored with Christ. Lord, may we truly worship you in your splendor and meditate on your wonderful deeds. We would ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.